Um, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second event in our underrepresented diversity and psychedelic research series. Um, thank you all for coming. Just um, some reminders before we start to please keep your microphone on mute uh, while the talks are going on. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions during the panel discussion at the end of the evening. Um, and if you do have any technical problems during the evening, you can message the host of this event, who's um, named Maudsley Psychedelic Society. Um, and my colleague Aster will be there um, to answer your questions. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Catherine. Uh, I'm a study coordinator working in the psychedelic trials group at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Um, where we're currently conducting phase two clinical trials investigating the use of psilocybin therapy uh, for treatment resistant depression. Um, and for, the, for those that don't know, psilocybin is often described as the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, um, which is then processed in the stomach into psilocin, uh, which is a compound that elicits psychedelic effects. And psilocybin has been used by many different communities around the world for centuries for medicinal purposes and as a sacrament. Um, and it was also used in psychiatry and clinical research extensively throughout the 50s and 60s in the West. Um, and again, it's currently being investigated as a novel treatment in psychiatry um, by many different institutions around the world. So this series of events focusing on diversity and inclusion were actually born out of the fact that we were not seeing diversity in the population of people expressing interest in participating in our clinical trials. Um, and if you attended the first event in this series that was held earlier this year, you might remember that my colleague Aster, who um, was our study nurse at the time and who gave the opening presentation at that first event, uh, she mentioned that in our previous psilocybin trial, uh, looking at the safety of psilocybin in healthy volunteers, 80% of participants included were white Caucasian. Um, and in our current trial that's ongoing, investigating the safety and efficacy of psilocybin um, in a treatment resistant depression population, 92% of those included so far have been Caucasian. Um, and this is pretty much in line with the percentage of people who actually apply for our studies. Um, of the 1,608 people who have applied to date, 82% have been either white British, white Irish, white European, or any other white background. Um, and uh, research done in the US, so a review of existing psychedelic research studies shows that these findings are not unique to our studies and that similar patterns have been seen um, in many other studies. So after making these observations, Aster said that we needed to do something about the lack of racial diversity in our trials, um, and she was right. So this series aims to stimulate a discussion to help identify some of the reasons we are seeing this lack of diversity so that we can update our recruitment tactics, um, so that we can help educate people about different perspectives surrounding psychedelic use, um, as well as to raise money for organizations that are doing some really good work to address disparities in mental health service provision. And tonight, the money from this event will be going to NAFSIAT Intercultural Therapy Center, um, which is a pioneering charity offering intercultural therapy in over 20 languages to people from diverse cultural communities. Um, our previous event in this series and my introduction so far has mainly been focusing on ethnic representation and diversity, or rather the lack thereof. Um, and most of us know that there are so many factors that interact and intersect to influence the experiences of any one individual or group of people. So before we start, I wanted to draw your attention to the concept of intersectionality. Um, the term intersectionality was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an American lawyer, civil rights advocate, philosopher, and a professor at UCLA School of Law and Columbia School of Law. Um, and the concept aims to describe how race, class, gender, sexuality, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another um, and overlap. And this concept um, originally helped to broaden the ideas of first and second wave feminism, which were largely focused on the experiences of women who were both white and middle class, um, aiming to include different experiences of women of color, women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, immigrant women, and other groups. Um, and intersectional feminine 
feminism sort of aims to separate itself from white feminism by acknowledging women's different experiences and identities. And this sort of concept of intersectionality can extend beyond feminism as well. So whilst critics, critics of this concept say that it creates sort of too much focus on identity politics, and I'm not really here to debate those criticisms, what the concept does help to achieve is to highlight that nuance is very important when talking about diversity and that one size does not fit all when talking about advantage versus disadvantage. And that perhaps identifying differences in access and inclusion is a good first step in addressing um, these problems that are identified. So how does this relate to psychedelics? Well, one qual sort of qualitative analyses of psychedelic experiences see a common theme of feelings of oneness with self and others, which in therapy can be very helpful for improving self-compassion and acceptance. But the sentiment that we are all the same and we are all one is not always helpful. Um, the idea of spiritual bypassing, where spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep personal and emotional unfinished business, or in other words, the use of spirituality as a crutch to avoid uncomfortable problems um, um, is relevant here. And this idea can be extrapolated to issues of diversity, um, where in fact, noticing our differences and embracing these can be just as therapeutic and, and helpful for social cohesion. Um, the retort that all lives matter demonstrates how viewing all of our situations as the same ignores the barriers and the privileges that are not uniform across various groups of people. Um, so perhaps to frame this in a positive light, I suggest the idea that by thinking about our similarities, we can improve our empathy, and by thinking about our differences, um, we improve our sympathy. So the reasons why I wanted to draw attention to this concept of inter intersectionality is because our speakers represent various different backgrounds and experiences today, um, and they've been invited to speak about the broader topic of diversity and inclusion in psychedelic research. Uh, with that said, one of our speakers, Mercedes Grant, will not be able to join us tonight due to unforeseen um, circumstances. So um, I keep saying tonight, I realize we might have some people from the US. So today we will be hearing from Darren Springer um, and Terence Ching, and we'll be coming together afterwards for a panel discussion and a Q&A session. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Darren Springer, um, or today he's here on his Zoom as Darren LeBaron. Uh, Darren is um, a teacher, mycologist, researcher, and event organizer based in London. He's the director of Ancient Future, um, convener of the Psychedelia Railway Gatherings, and curator at Earth Tone Arts and Soul and Sound. He's part of Breaking Convention Committee and works closely with funding, organizing thought-provoking talks and workshops in the capital. He develops projects geared around creative arts, personal development, and African Caribbean history, culture, and spirituality in his community. And collectively, his works aim to inform and empower individuals from diverse backgrounds to cope with social challenges and contribute to community development. So Darren is also a qualified organic horticulturalist and by day teaches organic gardening and food enterprise to so-called so -called hard to reach young people in particular those who have been temporarily or permanently excluded from mainstream school. Um, Darren is also a qualified permaculture teacher and facilitator, um, and he's worked with various organizations in uh, Europe and the UK to support both, um, supporting to create sustainable working systems and environments using permaculture. So um, Darren, if you'd like to share your screen, I'll hand over to you. Good evening. Let me just get this set up. So can you just confirm for me that you can see the screen? I can be seen. I'm not yeah, I'm not yeah, great. Okay, so first and foremost, I'd just like to thank Esther and Catherine for the invitation this evening to share with yourselves and all. As I mentioned, my name is Darren Springer, also known as Darren the Baron. This evening, I'm just going to bring highlights to just some areas of interest of mine personally in the field of psychedelics, mental health, 
and how what I've observed over the years in my time working with young people and just doing my own research. I have no clinical background, um, but I have a background in working with young minds and understanding and being one of those young people when, you know, in the past, um, just the processes that we have gone through here in the UK. So tonight's just gonna highlight on kind of like the African Caribbean experience in the UK, as well as how that relates to psychedelics, the psychedelic research is currently taking place. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share. Um, so I'm gonna start here in the present and simply because we're in the, the current climate, you know, I've just cut, got in and there's, you know, conversations that are, that take place once I leave my house or geared around COVID and the pandemic. And I'm not gonna get into that, but it's just really on the fact that we're dealing with mental health that I feel that we're in a current climate where we're, our mental health, our yeah, mental comfortability is being challenged. You know, we're being kind of yeah, nudged in directions and places and spaces that you know we're not used to. And it's kind of we're stepping into unknown spaces and that in itself can breed anxiety and you know other mental health challenges. But I'm aware that it's affecting all of us. You know, no matter what school of thought or where you're from, whether you know what's going on, you think you know what's going on, you know, and you're aware, um, there's a lot going on. And um, with that said, I would really like to highlight what I'm observing within my own experience taking plant medicine, taking psychedelics. Um, it was kind of like a preparation. It has been a preparation of some sort because the experience itself I know always allows you to step into the unknown. There's no guarantees. And um, that reoccurring experience can filter through into your day-to-day -day life and world and support you in dealing with unknown situations. And this article here goes into that as far as the psychedelic experience disrupts routine thinking. And so has the coronavirus pandemic. I'm not gonna read through it, but it's just suggesting that, that you know, that breaking the cycle, breaking the routine and how it brings out things in people, brings out sometimes the best, sometimes maybe the worst. But nonetheless, this um, experience um, of unexpectedness um, basically can, you know, you can use that as a fuel, so to speak. And that's what the psychedelic experience can do. And some people are suggesting that through Corona, you know, they've got or the pandemic and lockdown and these experiences that it's actually allowed them to explore themselves. And they found parts of themselves that if they was at work doing a nine to five, they necessarily wouldn't have been, you know, experiencing. So with that said, although we're aware of, you know, the, the connections with the psychedelic experience and the potential disrupting the routine of things, that can also increase people's mental health challenges, obviously. But it's also suggested that psychedelic drugs could also help mental health, the potential mental health epidemic that we'll face after coronas. So as well as being something that could prepare you for a pandemic like corona virus, it's also something that could support you in your healing process. But with that said and done, we're dealing with diversity and being someone of African and Caribbean heritage, first generation born in the UK, you know, when I see stuff like this, it's really interesting. I'm not sure how many of you are privy to the data that's currently out there that suggests that, you know, COVID in particular is affecting black and minority ethnic people at higher rates than others and that they're dying at higher rates than other populations. And, um, you know, this is, you know, relevant information. Um, but at the same time, you know, what does it serve? How does it serve us in regards to some of the slides that I'll be sharing with you just as far as, is this something new? You know, are these things, are these stats, are these data new, or is there a history or elements of this taking place that may have impacted some of these groups before now? So with that said, in the current climate, we've got obviously people are aware of the, the murder of George Floyd, which inspired things like the Black Lives Matter movement. To this day, you know, there's still, you know, a consciousness around this that needs to be, you know, brought to the forefront. But I'm always at the forefront of my community and doing work where um, I always highlight that it's not always been unicorn but unicorns and bubbles. I'm really glad and inspired that some people are becoming aware of the, um, the injustice that has taken place over the years, generations in fact, and, um, and they're aware of that. But again, there's people who have been, you know, have been on the ground and working through this. And I'm one of those individuals and my work, as I mentioned, or was mentioned, working with young people in particular, those who have been kicked out of school, just come out of prison and so forth. I realized just as far as um, the, the reasons why they got caught up in the things that they were getting caught up in that would lead them to get into trouble, you know, it was, was really deep. And um, I've started to acknowledge, you know, that these people are carrying stuff, you know, an energy, a mental 
thing, <laughs> you know, that um, wasn't serving them well. And I didn't really think they acknowledged that they had this thing, you know, and it was like normal to have an attitude. It was normal to, you know, to, to speak and, you know, to communicate with people that are, with a certain energy, a certain tone. And, um, you know, that would, it, it, was, it was an unhealthy communication. And these were then things that I understood would lead young people to make some of the decisions that they would make. So we're like, you've got stats here coming back from 2011, but it, since 2001, you would find that over half or just under half, should I say, of the offenders inside um, the young offenders prisons are black or ethnic minority groups. You've got a high increase in young black males in particular committing suicide. You've got a range of um, males in particular in our community that do not address their mental health challenges simply because it's still considered to, a taboo to discuss these things. Even just to go to the doctor for a health check is, you know, not, you know, there's, there's not much reason to be doing that if you can sort yourself out, so to speak, simply because there's taboos and there's taboos that may not be um, justified, but are, there definitely are some that are justified as to why people stay away from the system. They don't trust the mental health system, so to speak. They don't trust the GP. And, um, this is basically one of the reasons why, because it's an, an article dealing with suicide, suicide in particular, and the article is looking at suicide isn't just a white people thing, simply because those who are going through the system really understand that a lot of the times it's kind of like it says here, I urge organizations and programs to avoid the one size fits all approach, as was mentioned earlier on. And um, Kimia Dennis in this article goes into like what she's often asked that she's wasting her time addressing race, ethnicity and other cultural variations. And as was made or highlighted earlier on, these are fundamental things that make us unique, that make us special. And at the same time, um, rather than using it as a way to, you know, um, to justify the harm and injustice that we do, there's ways where this is more, you know, we can use it for integration. But what I'm aware of as a horticulturalist, Okay, I'll just say something. As a horticulturalist, as a food grower, you know, in the garden, you know, just outside, we're aware that we can't just design a garden, you know, the same garden for every single garden. We've got to be conscious of, you know, um, the environment, the orientation of the sun, where the water sources are. And I'm aware that, you know, in fashion houses, people get bespoke designs and the one size fits all doesn't crossover when it comes to designing your garden. So why would that be the case, for example, in edu education? And that's what I found within education, the field of work that I worked in. And I, I was also involved a lot in conversations and dialogues around diversity, equality, and inclusion. And although it works well, in principle, I found that in many cases, it was more basically a tick box thing. You know, as a teenager, I was conscious of the fact that we had to create things like equal opportunity policies and I would ask, like, why do we have to write a form to treat people equal? Like, why, why don't we do that? Why can't we do that? Why do we have to have these forms? And then people create these forms and don't actually follow them through because there's an institutionalized system that doesn't support diversity, equality, and inclusion. So therefore, in principle, it sounds good. And on paper, it looks good. But in practice, it doesn't actually apply in a lot, in a lot of cases. And this is highlighted here by Bernard Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. That's all about engagement and participation. And that's how I found my work with young people was applied in engaging young people. If you wanted to get them to the venue, we would, not have, we would need to go to find where the young people are at to engage them. If they're not coming, we need to go to them and find out why they're not coming. You know, we have to make the stance. Or if we're sitting here waiting and wondering why, then nothing will move, you know, nothing will, there won't be any progress. And a lot of the times when we talk about equality, as it highlights here, it's not the same as participation. And it really is about having people engaged in the activities. And I know there's challenges to that as we're sharing this evening. But when you deal with mental health specifically, there's, you know, the Mental Health Foundation here in the UK. I've got four main areas that they go into. We're not going to go into it here right now, but I encourage you to check out their website. Because again, this is pre-COVID. These are things that were already challenges in these diverse communities of black and ethnic minority groups. You know, you've got racism and discrimination. Obviously today we, we would like to think things are a lot better since, you know, three, four, five hundred years ago. But what we understand now is racism and discrimination just comes in different forms, different shapes and different guises now. And that also impacts, impacts social and economic equalities. I'm fully aware that when my family, my grandmother and 
grandparents came over from the Caribbean. They came over as well to do people. They were very successful back home. And the challenges that they faced in basically being going from being world to do people to being at the bottom of the ladder when they arrived in the UK, and then at the same time, um, that it wasn't being it wasn't justified. These are some of the things that the luggage that they started to pick up um, during their journey here, and that is absolutely. Um, slowly but surely impacted on the on the future generations which leads to mental health stigma and as i've mentioned earlier on just the criminal justice system and how disproportionate levels of people of color that are in prison and there's several other factors that impact mental health and if they're not addressed then these things continue to take place so so with that said there's the potential of psychedelic healing in my community, psychedelics is pretty much a taboo. When I say my community, my community is your community, but in the sense of where I've been placed and located, I'm in a high residence area of people of colour. Primarily, there's a lot of gentrification that has taken place. But when I see these things in front of me, these statements like sadness, stress, anxiety, depression, illness, and so forth, I'm aware that these things impact everybody and are everywhere, but just at different levels and degrees. And I wouldn't have been aware up until me stepping into this field on a personal quest that psychedelic could potentially work and support me personally in these in you know in these tasks but if you look at the current research where in what's currently called the psychedelic renaissance you know licenses have been granted and various spaces and places are able to do the research and i think it's amazing that we can now get clinical scientific research that backs what i would consider the asian technology as was highlighted there's you know these organisms these so-called plant medicines have been in cultures and traditions for thousands of years in some cases but it's suggested here that magic mushrooms could potentially replace antidepressants within the next five years again these are these are some of the research that's taking place in the united kingdom so in our place and space as well as the united states and canada and other places around the world so in the uk we're also with the psychedelic society their campaign have been supporting the legalization or the rescheduling of psilocybin simply because recent trials using psilocybin have been able to treat depression and anxiety and we've returned staggering results with 80 percent of patients reporting significantly improved well-being or life satisfaction for six months on one single dose as we're aware when you get caught up in this system and you're dependent upon medication a lot of times it's a daily dose and it's several daily doses one dose to correct the previous dose and so forth and you've got a cabinet full of you know prescription drugs and i'm not 100 percent convinced that it's getting to the root of the problem because obviously we've got these ongoing cases and there's several other types of research going on specifically with psilocybin working with cancer patients who are at the late stages of cancer and it's dealing with their anxiety LSD can also support people with their anxiety. You know, this is, you know, kind of TV news. It's being put out there. And you just need to go on the internet nowadays and find out the therapeutic potential of psychedelics from the clinical studies and research, all the various conferences, right down to the Tom, Dick or Harry or Jane, June or Jill, who may be giving their personal blogs and vlogs on, you know, on YouTube, so to speak. So with that said, I'm aware from my background, what's supported me working with some of the young people who had mental health challenges, happy, or what got them out of those terms like the sadness, their depression and so forth. I wasn't able to provide them psychedelics, but I was able to give them access to the forest. And this is where I also consider as a horticulturist, a permaculturist, this is the organic technology. You know, This is what actually provides us with these plants and medicines that we're making reference to. So just being in these places and spaces has therapeutic potential, just touching the soul, touching the soul. You don't have to engage in it too much, just breathing in a deep, deep breath is the ways that you can benefit from being in these places and spaces. And I would like to introduce you to the first people that you ever find in the forest in recorded as well as unrecorded history. And these are people of the forest known as so-called pygmies, simply because they have they have that they have their own names. The pygmies a term that was given to them by Europeans, but they go by names like the Twa, the Aka, the Baka, the Mbuti, the Babongo. And you find them primarily in Central Africa, the Congo, Gabon, and aspects in West Africa. You also find groups in Southern Africa or South Africa. But just to bring them forward and highlight that they're actually a global people, I always like to make reference because these people predate um, a lot of our recorded history. And when you look into prehistory, you find that on every single continent, you find these small people. And it all ties in, in my opinion, with a lot of the mythologies we have of the world, um, different places around the world that deal with the little people, you know, the leprechaun, the pixie realms, as well as the machine elves that Terence McKenna talks about. 
But the point that I'm making is um, that these people were the first people to start engaging in these plants and dealing with these plants in particular, and also come from the forest regions. As I mentioned, these are very ancient people. And these were the people that introduced us to knowledge and information geared around Ibogaine, as we refer to it here, as far as that active ingredient that you find in, a, in Iboga. And um, because we've got these ancient groups that deal with this knowledge and information and have been for hundreds, if not thousands of years, I'm really interested in what they've got to say about these potentially therapeutic plants. And the studies that are suggested here that relate to Ibogaine um, connect with heroin addiction, alcohol recovery, as well as trauma. And as much as um, if you were just to kind of Google Ebola, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see Ebola is good for heroin addicts, you know, heroin addicts. Click this button and you can come on a retreat, pay a few thousand pounds and deal with your addiction. And in a lot of times and cases and testimonies that you find, it's actually accurate. And the research is suggesting that Ebola in particular, that the, the type of plant it is the active ingredients within the plant, it's really good at, you know, um, basically within the psyche, whatever gives us the addiction, it's good at stopping that, you know, um, and, and de addressing that in comparison to other psychedelics. But my question being is that although it's great for heroin addiction, because these are one of the challenges that are facing my community with my family, young people in the community as a whole, drugs, you know, and the impact of the drugs. And um, but my curiosity led me to a question. I wonder if they have heroin addicts in Gabon. And I'm glad to tell you that they don't have heroin addicts in, G in Gabon. So my question therefore was, well, why do they use these plants? What are these plants actually for? And when you go in to find out what these plants are for, without giving you the backdrop of, you know, ultimately these plants are for these people to communicate with their ancestors. That's what they say these plants were gifted to them for, not for heroin addiction, not for trauma, not for, you know, alcohol. It was to engage with their ancestors. That's what the mythology and the oral tradition suggests. But as far as the role that it plays in the community, it supports them with promoting radical spiritual growth. So it's going to their spiritual system, as well as stabilizes community and family structure and resolves pathological problems. So again, these are all things that I will consider potentially could be things that could be prevented. So by the partaking in this, because what we find is that they don't have the trauma, they don't have the things that we're using this for as medicine, because in their day-to-day -day life, in their way of life, these things are part and parcel and support them in preventing those things from happening from what I'm observing. So with that said, what's going on in the sense of that you've got these Asian people and practices all around the world, not just in Africa, obviously um, Asia and the, and the Americas too. And, you know, there's a missing link, you know, when you've got their descendants in places and spaces now around the world, primarily Europe, me and the UK, who are disconnected from that information and knowledge, but also could potentially benefit highly from this information that's being provided by the research that's being out. But we have blockages and barriers. And again, a lot of the times we don't get what we don't want to address things and get to the root of the problem. So it's easy to say that these young people are bad and they stab and shoot each other and this gang stuff and the post-cold rivalry is not is no good. But there's a reason behind that. I always bring to the forefront. I, I'm, I was one of these young people at one point in time. I still work with them. I have children myself. And we don't wake up in the morning one day and just want to start sh stabbing and shooting people. We don't just, you know, hate each other for those not for no purpose there you know there's reasons behind that and then when we start getting to the root and i'm not going to even say that this is the root there's some pre-conditioning that takes place but there's been an impact a load that people of african descent especially around europe have picked up and we are not aware that we carry it making reference to the young people i said earlier on who have got this attitude got this way of approaching things they don't actually know why they're acting like that and um, it's no different from if you're an alcoholic, let's say, and you want to deal with your alcoholism and you go to an AA meeting, you've got to first step in there and say, you know, my name's Darren and I'm an alcoholic. You know, from that stage there, I can start to address that. I'm acknowledging the meeting that I've got it and I can go through. But if I don't know I'm an alcoholic, if I just, if I just give an alcohol every day and that's the norm, that's just being drunk and legless is just the norm. I don't even acknowledge that I've got a problem. And when you ask some of the people as far as their challenges, they're actually not aware of the impact of some of the things that have taken place. So this represents the, sl the, um, the slave trade between Europe, the Americas and Africa. By way of Africa, um, indigenous people were kidnapped and taken to other lands that were not theirs, didn't speak the language, and they were mixed and branded with other groups of people. So again, what we're looking at is mental health and the challenges as well as the trauma that comes along with going to a place coming from Africa and ending up maybe in Jamaica 
just come from Jamaica, in fact. And with that said, Jamaica was known as Breaker Islands, one of the Breaker Islands. You had several islands in the Caribbean islands that were there to break in the slaves. The whole idea was that in preparation to send them to the Americas or send them to other islands, these were the islands where they were branded and broken in, basically. So there's just the idea of leaving somewhere and going somewhere new. I remember when my children, my children were homeschooled and for the first parts of their life. And when they started school, the teacher said that this could be a traumatic experience for children. There's some children who have been moved from one school to another and it cut trauma based upon that. So it was really, you know, sensitive to my children's experience in getting into school. So that was just going to a new school, let alone going to another country by force and not being aware of what's going on, getting there, being branded separated from your family that's one thing in itself and then let alone to be physically abused mentally abused and tortured as well as killed these are some of the things that have taken place that we kind of sweep under the rug a lot of the times i'm not aware that these things have been continued continually um, implemented but maybe not in the physical ways that they are but there are mental shackles still and although the people got their freedom and we were allowed to explore we were brought back to our colonizers islands like the United Kingdom during the wind rush and came and served the same colonizers again and in a new land where we thought this time around it would be, you know, right on we've got, because as my mother was taught before she came, these streets would be our paved with gold and there was going to be these great opportunities to set up an amazing future for yourselves. And we came, as I said, my grandparents came to skill people as a nurse, as a nurse, they came as carpenters and tradesmen. And at the same time on their arrival, there was barriers. So again, not being aware that they had gone through these impacts and trying to make a new start, there's barriers in this new land. And it leads to a new generation. I became that generation, the first generation born and conceived in the UK, at least definitely conceived and born in the UK, which created this black British culture, which basically leads us to who we've got today. And there's a lot of history that I'm not able to share with you just due to the restriction on time. But it's just to remind you that when you see these guys on the street, they do have mental health challenges. But they're not aware that they have mental health challenges to the degree that they've been clinically diagnosed with it. But they're aware, in conversations, they're aware the things they go up to don't serve them well. But in a lot of cases, the answer is, this is all I've got. These are the options that I have available to me. And this is why I make decisions that I make. And if there are other options or alternatives, they would go for it. And they do because the work that I do with them that gives them an, another alternative to generate a financial income allows them to say, oh, I don't need to sell weed or crack as much because I can sell food and I've learned how to grow and sell, you know, various types of salads and they can generate an income for me. And if you give them the chance and the opportunity, it's there for them to take and those who take it, they actually do. But what's going on? How did they go from, you know, us well-to-do families, you know, we were my grandparents, my parents raised us well, but we were caught up, we got caught up. And we went from this and we were once this. These are the same young boys that you would find who are given the opportunity to exercise their energy. And I say that to say that these guys, United Kingdom, and these guys, Eastern Africa, are the same guys. You see these guys, they've got sticks, they've got weapons, they go around and they fight and they rumble and tumble, but they don't kill each other for no reason. It's all parts of their rites of passage. It's all part of the initiation from boyhood to manhood. They're taught that, hey, look, we spot and see that you're a fighter, you've got this energy. We're not gonna tell you that that's wrong. What we're gonna do is, Show you how to be the warrior for the village, how to protect the village, because we live in a region where there's lions. And if the lions come into the village and want to eat the women and the children, some of us have got to be brave enough to stand up and fight that lion. So having that energy isn't wrong, it isn't bad. It's just how you use it. Where, you know, how do you use and direct that fuel? And the reason why the fuel is being misdirected is simply because we've got this baggage, this load that's not being talked about or addressed. So for those who are not familiar with Dr. D Dr. Joy DeGroy and others who bring to the forefront um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, which basically looks at the reality that people of African descent and those in the diaspora in the Americas as well as Europe have gone through this um, experience and have basically got no support whatsoever. I've had no therapeutic, no financial support. There's been an absence of opportunity to access these services and provide us with what's required to become, to be healed. And with that said, with all the um, disproportionate levels of poor health, poor education and all the rest of it alongside this, this is what's leading us to have young people turning out like this. I always bring to the forefront that this people of African descent have been a 
experiment. We've been, we've, it's a project we've been experimented on for the last 500 years, you know, and all of this, like I know this simply because working with plants, if you take a plant from Scotland and you bring it down to London, it's not going to do too well if it's used to the soil in Scotland and all the rest of it, let alone taking a lie and taking things and messing around and playing around for whatever reasons, maybe not to serve the people them well. And that's why you'll get what we're currently having. There's a reason, there's roots to this. And what we're finding out, what science is suggesting, is that we inherit and pass on our genes, obviously. And we know this, but within those genes are locked our trauma, are locked our behaviours and all these types of things. So if we're going back to 500 years and looking at some of the things that people experience, witness, you know, mothers seeing their children being killed, husbands' penises being cut off, men seeing their wives' stomachs being cut open and babies falling out onto the floor. And these are things that have been documented that Europeans were doing to Africa. To African people on the con I mean in the in the Caribbean and in the in the Americas. So this is what science is saying that gets passed on. This is in my genes. This is stuff that would have somebody not knowing or understanding why they're angry and vexed all the time and short, you know, uh, have a, has a short fuse and are basically carrying PTSD, the same um, ideas around PTSD or the you know the, the outcomes of that are the same things that you would see with PTSS, post-traumatic slave syndrome, but there's specific things that need to be addressed or have brought those things out of those individuals that need to be looked at. But with that said, the PTSD is being looked at. MDMA research that's happening here in the UK as well as the United States. You know, the research is amazing. I'm about to round up now, I've got like 30 minutes. The research was amazing. It was conclusive that there was like, the MDMA worked on 100% of the participants. 68%, it totally eliminated the PTSD. 32% significantly reduced. These were soldiers who had signed up for war consciously and then weren't able to deal with it coming back into you know, civilian life, basically. And with that said, they were able to, after partaking in the, you know, the MDMA, supported with therapeutic sessions, I think it was like three, up to three sessions, you, at the end of it, they're like, hey, 68% PTSD totally gone. So I'll share this and bring this to the forefront simply because there's soldiers out there, as I said, who co-sign for what they co-sign, that they, they know what they're getting into when they sign up for it. You know, you may not know where you're posting and where, how it's going to end up, but you know what you're getting into. You know whose side you're signing up for. And there's some soldiers on the street that I work with. They literally are soldiers, you know, they're in the sense of they, they do the same things and they've witnessed the same things. Like they've seen people get stabbed, shot and all the rest of it. I'm not co-signing it, but I'm just saying that these are things that they live with and move on and it's normal. These are some of the normal things I'm talking about that they roll through. So if they may get stabbed or shanked and killed, they still need to make money the next day. They still need to get back on the block. They still need to just go get on with that stuff. And that's what they're getting on with. And obviously with all what we know as doctors and scientists and all the rest of it, that's something that needs to be <laughs> needs to be nipped in the bud. Or what's gonna happen is we're gonna have the same history repeating itself simply because the usual suspects always look like the usual suspects. These are the bad guys, I like this movie, the usual suspects. But you know, usually the suspects look like this. But in this case, what we need to do is make the audience and the environments more diverse. And that's what the research in America is suggesting by Monica Williams and her research with MDMA and PTSD, but she was specifically targeting people of color of African, her African Caribbean heritage in America for race-based trauma. And the research is great. And you know, what the report is suggesting is that, you know, although the, um, the process, I think, you know, works well, um, it was difficult to engage participants. It's difficult to actually get them involved in this, as well as get the support to make this happen, I guess, on different departments and areas. So the fact that this is now a conversation and a dialogue, I think it's really interesting. Those of you who are in these professions, I think, if you're not, obviously need to become more aware of the impact of history and these cultures and why you've got some of the clients that you may have today. And ideally, the fact that they are connected to these plants indigenously and have a cultural um, reference point and those things should be factored into when the practices and the licenses and all the other things take place and i'm just coming to the end now just to share with everybody that i feel that through my own personal journey because i was stuck in a community i grew up in east london primarily with african and caribbean people and asian people it was I had to come out of my own comfort zone to start engaging in other audience to learn the knowledge that I wanted to learn, as well as meet the people I needed to meet, meet to, you know, to, to uh, make ends meet, you know, not financially, but to make the community meet. That's what we call the community, the ends. So it's coming out of my comfort zone, no different from I would advise 
the horticultural groups that I was with, if you want to get young people to come out of our comfort zone and go and hang to where go on to where the young people are at. So I'm engaging in, I mean, I'm trying to inspire those of you that are involved in these schools that it's not about sitting down and waiting for these people to turn up. You really have to be proactive and get out there, find where these people are, why are you not coming? What's going on? That's got to be like first phase before you decide why you're doing what you're doing. For example, say, if we're going to build a youth club, there shouldn't be 30 adults sitting around there designing this youth club. We need to have some young people in there because it's going to be their youth club and we're trying to get them inside here. So by having a more diverse people around the table, engaged, not a second thought, I think that's where we could create a brighter future. Everybody will be happy. My name is Darren Spring, also known as Deborah Darren LeBaron, and that's my presentation. Thanks so much for your talk, Darren. Um, I really like the metaphor that you said at the beginning, um, where each garden as a horticulturist, you know, has different needs. Um, that was really good image to have. And I think that we'll save all the questions that people might have for the very end, because we've got a lengthy amount of time um, for people to talk and hopefully we can stimulate a discussion on some of the stuff that you brought up in your talk. Um, but thank you again. Um, so we're going to move on to our next talk for today. Um, um, the next speaker is Terence Ching. Um, Terence is in the final stage of his doctoral training in clinical psychology um, at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in the United States. Um, prior to moving there, Terence received his bachelor's and master's degree in psychology at the National Institute of Singapore, uh, sorry, National University of Singapore. Um, recently, he successfully defended his doctoral dissertation, which examined ethno-racial differences in efficacy and safety of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for treating chronic PTSD in an open-label trial sponsored by MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, Terence has completed clinical training in a variety of settings. Um, Terence approaches psychotherapy from an evidence-based and culturally attuned perspective and specializes in cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, um, for fear, uncertainty, um, and trauma-based disorders, including OCD, anxiety disorders, and PTSD. Uh, Terence has also received training in functional analytic psychotherapy, as well as MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And Terence believes in his client's intrinsic ability to achieve insights and enact behavioral change according to CBT principles, especially when supported in a holistic and sensitive manner that respects and integrates their values, beliefs, and learning and cultural histories. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Terence. I do apologize for that lengthy bio. <laughs> Not anticipated that you were going to. I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to cut out anything because it's all great. Wonderful. Um, well, uh, very nice to meet everyone and so honored uh, to have been invited for uh, this talk today. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so today the topic or the title of my talk is Attuning to Culture in MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy. I just want to, you know, give more introduction to who I am. I come from Singapore, uh, that we know that it's a British colony, 50 odd years of uh, democratic independence, moved to the United States um, approximately six years ago for my PhD. I also identify as part of the queer community, sexually speaking, I identify as gay, but I also identify as uh, a, a, a queer individual because of, you know, what it symbolizes for me, being part of a counterculture, being part of a group that doesn't necessarily fit neatly into categories or boxes. Um, so Singapore and its 50 odd years of independence has evolved dramatically from a, a fishing village to a metropolitan area. Um, it has, it is multicultural in its uh, demographic. Um, there are four main groups, uh, predominantly folks of Chinese or Asian descent, um, folks of Malay descent, folks of Indian descent, as well as a lot of European and Eurasian um, folks as well. Um, 
where I come from, we express our culture through food. And being Singaporean is a distinct identity um, where it, people like to think of Singapore or people from Singapore like to think of it as a melting pot of cultures. And that shows up in its food um, where a lot of different like specific cooking techniques or in the use of specific ingredients get meshed together um, in a wonderful fusion. Um, at the same time, Singapore also has very archaic drug laws um, where the trafficking and possession uh, and not even use of a certain amount of um, what would be classified as a class A drug or in the, in the United States, uh, the parallel is a schedule one substance would uh, be dealt with, with uh, um, extensive time in prison, um, caning, as well as uh, the drug panel, uh, the death penalty, which has been um, administered and, and uh, executed for a few cases of drug trafficking across, you know, nation lines, country lines. At the same time, Singapore also has very archaic laws on um, same-sex uh, sexual uh, interactions, uh, specifically targeting uh, men who have sex with men. Um, and although that's not actively enforced, uh, not to my knowledge, it's seeks to convey the sentiment that Singapore is large, by and large, always gonna be a heteronormative society. So because of all of these considerations, because of my background as a gay Singaporean um, uh, uh, man, um, I have always felt like I wasn't really belonging as part of like, you know, mainstream society. And that was part of my thought process being more involved in psychedelic research, you know, like in psychedelic research in the academic circles that I function in, it hasn't been thought of as something that's conventional. So it, it naturally felt like the perfect fit for me because it wasn't normative. It wasn't stuff that everyone else was doing. It was something that spoke to me because of how special and queer it was. Um, so in my experience, um, as part of the therapist training trial, um, all clinicians who are trained to be uh, a MAPS therapist um, had the chance to go through a single dosing session themselves. So this w is art that I drew um, as, uh, as my dosing session with MDMA began. So it began with me feeling some electricity in my brain. Um, I had um, pretty stunning visual um, uh, experiences and I felt tactilely like almost like as if my own arms were reaching out from within me to, uh, to, to wrap around me, uh, enveloping me in, in, into the, the, the beginning of a wonderful psychedelic experience. Um, so Somewhere early on in my experience, I had visions that really tapped into what I call the cultural pride here. Um, so in Singapore um, and other uh, certain Southeast Asian nations, uh, there is the distinctive uh, corpse flower. So it is the world's largest flower and it is named the corpse flower because it gives off a very odorous scent. Um, some may uh, uh, liken it to uh, the smell of rotting flesh. So during my experience, I actually found myself dancing and, and hopping right into the hole of the uh, corpse flower and dancing among the spores. And I, um, they were just floating around me and I was right in there. I couldn't smell anything. I was having a wild time. I was having fun and it felt super liberating to me. So what that conveyed to me was that I need to always remember where I come from, no matter where I go and that I need to embrace dance and celebrate uh, every aspect of my cultural identity, my identity as a Singaporean person, 
um, even the strangest parts or the parts that may seem the strangers to folks who aren't part of my culture. I need to be proud of that. Um, so later on in my experience, I had other visual experiences that really tapped into the theme of uh, feeling pride as part of the LGBTQ community. community. Um, so I could distinctively, now I was like in the middle of the ocean, I could see a giant horseshoe crab swimming toward me. And I couldn't quite get this to work perfectly, but I, I saw that attached to the back of the giant horseshoe crab was a giant mermaid's tail. And it was iridescent, it was mesmerizing, and it drew me closer and I found myself diving deeper into the iridescence and in the hues of the different colors of the rainbow and try as I may I couldn't see any distinct uh, divisions between all of these different hues they seem to melt into one another um, and what I got from that actually um, was that I need to find some comfort knowing that I'm unique like a horseshoe crab with a giant mermaid still attached to its back, that my lived experiences need not conform to the heteronormative categories that society seeks to impose on everyone, um, that I don't have to fit neatly into the boxes, that I can affirm myself even if I wasn't uh, out to certain people in my life, that I can... Uh, be who I am. I'm unique. I don't need to fit into these boxes. Um, later on, I think this was closer to the peak of my experience. I had other visual experiences and, and in consultation with like other folks who have been through similar psychedelic experiences or have taken MDMA, it seemed like I was having a lot of visual experiences. Um, but this one really tapped into the idea of intersectionality. So I found myself on a large grass field and in the distance I could see galloping toward me a, a, a horse and then attached to its back was actually an alligator. Uh, so instead of where the tail should have been, it was the body of an alligator attached to its back. And it seemed like the alligator was actually pretty agitated, frustrated, uh, impatient with the horse and actually snapping at its heels, which was why the horse was kind of running toward me. And over time, you know, like um, the horse would slow down and then the alligator would, you know, seem to like curl up onto the horse's back. And, and really they, they, they seem to be able to like coexist and then this happened, this went on for some time. I could see them oscillate between being pretty agitated to being pretty relaxed. And then all of a sudden they dissolved into a full length mirror. So obviously I'm gonna walk towards it. So I walked towards it and I saw myself in the mirror and I saw from within my chest emanating the Chinese characters for wood which is here, and fire, which is here. So you could, and, and over time, like gradually they seem to merge into each other. And you could see how, like, if you're looking at it uh, strokes wise, it had very similar strokes uh, for two distinct elements, but they seem to melt together and it seemed like the tree was on fire, but, but it wasn't burning out. And what this indicated to me is that I needed to hold the mirror up to my conflicts of allegiances. Do I identify only as um, a, a person of color or do I only identify as a, a queer individual? Can I find comfort and solace and um, um, some sense of community being a queer person of color? Um, it really made me understand that I needed to think about things more intersectionally, that there is space for all of the different identities that I hold, that I can coexist with every part of me, even though it's challenging. Um, 
And these are, I want to end with some questions that I don't particularly have the answers to. And I, I want to invite some discussion around that. And, and if anything, just some thoughts about that. How do we continue to improve attunement to culture in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or psychedelic therapy at large? Do therapists need to meet people halfway, do their homework, get familiar with the history of racism in various Western cultures, while also practicing cultural humility, humility as they navigate the psychedelic space? Do we need to really diversify study staff to convey almost like conspicuously and obviously to people that we understand what it's like to be vulnerable in this psychedelic space and you may actually be more um, likely to participate if you see people who look like you. Do we need to introduce diversity in the setting, elements of the setting in which we hold the psychedelic experience? Um, do we also need to assess for people's level of development with their identity, uh, it may have an influence on whether uh, or how well people take to some of these visual or otherwise insights in their psychedelic experiences as a way to develop their identity. And obviously there are, this is not an exhaustive list of questions. Um, there are many more questions that we need to continue to think about. But I want to leave some time for Q and A, um, and I just want to express a lot of gratitude to Kenneth, and a lot of gratitude to folks who worked on the dissertation with me together, as well as the study team and the funding sources for this work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you um, had a nice break, whatever you did. Um, so I think we can um, move on to the panel discussion and the Q&A. Um, if Terence and Darren wouldn't mind um, turning on their videos and unmuting themselves. Um, basically, when, when we do these panels, we really want it to be an open discussion. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, if no one else is speaking, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, to open your video and um, ask a question directly, or if you're not comfortable with doing that, you can ask a question in the chat, and we can um, we can we can read it out. So um, I can see Jonathan has his hand up. Jonathan, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much um, for organizing this, and um, uh, both your talks were uh, very very enlightening and uh, I've actually learned a lot especially with um, what I've been experiencing myself and um, actually I've got two questions I don't know if that's breaking the rules I've got one question for um, um, Darren and one question for Terence as well um, the first question I'll ask uh, Darren um, I think the part about um, you saying about how um, you know these boys going from boyhood to manhood um, like in, in villages where um, you know, um, where they are given a mission or sort of a, a, a way of, of living, i.e. The, the warrior that protects the village. I think that was, that was very, uh, that, that was very enlightening. And I'd love to hear more about it. Um, if you could maybe like guide me in terms of like, uh, where I can find more information about this and I, where I can read more, because I, I think personally, um, in sort of uh, my own kind of, uh, discoveries, uh, through, um, what I've been going through, I, I I've come kind of come come in contact with the shadow in a way, and a lot of people say shadow work, and I think that kind of relates to that. You know, going um, like having a lot of these internal energies within you sometimes can be destructive, but doesn't always have to be dis destructive. So yes, um, Darren, if you may. Yeah, thank you for your question. I believe um, in, in general, when you go through indigenous African cultures, it's kind of like a primary setup for initiation. You know, it's like, and I find this all around the world, there's an, you know, initiation rites for all different purposes, everything from the birthing ceremony, naming ceremony, you name it. And once you reach into puberty, you know, um, what we call puberty is manhood, basically. You go through for a transition. So there's no teenager and years and that type of stuff. You go from a child to an adult. And that process is a series of tasks, series of 
things that one would need to do, things that one needs to learn and so forth, everything from how to chop, how to catch lions, you know, you name it. But a big part and parcel of um, these traditions, with these rites with the young boys and them understanding the various plants and concoctions, as you find that there's a psychoactive that goes in line with a lot of the initiation rites. So for example, say when, you know, with the Zulu tribe, for example, when the young boys are going through their warriorship rites, they're given these various brews that contain cannabis, DMT, they have various snuff packs that they need to learn how to identify those plants, put those things together, and it supports them in their journey. So various groups have, a, have different approaches. And where you could go um, is just looking into the various groups or tribes that you may have interest in. Um, Madoma Soma, um, who comes to mind? Um, off the top of my head, I can't, yeah, I would, you know, feel free to take my details, even when I just, yeah, I could give you like some solid, yeah, some solid references in particular to go to. But um, you'll find that, yeah, as far as the rights, you know, you look at the Fuller tribe in Western Africa, basically from north, south, east, west, there's these various rights that go hand in hand with the usage of these plants that support them, the young boys, and as I understand it, discovering themselves understanding who they are rather than waiting until you have a midlife crisis with your back up against the wall and trying to understand out what you're here for and what's the purpose of life you're kind of given those directions as a you know as a child so you're prepared for adulthood then which then leads you into eldership you know that's, there's other rights that then move you into you know into becoming an elder so um it's part and parcel of the traditions as i understand it the various groups do it differently thank you um, and, and just a quick one for uh, Terence, if that's okay. Um, so, um, well, your, your presentation uh, is, is very close, close to my heart, partly because um, I spent the first 10 years um, of my life in Singapore and I understand a lot of the cultural diversity and sort of um, multiculturalism in there. And I was wondering what you meant by uh, cultural humility, actually, if you could elaborate on that, please. Thank you for your question. I think, um the way I understand it, cultural humility um, emphasizes doing a lot of a, a lot of background homework on what it's like to be a person of a particular identity or set of identities, and also be willing to be wrong, you know, or, or stand corrected when you're faced with an interaction with that person that doesn't quite fit cleanly into your preconceived notions or your, your knowledge boxes. Like, oh, oh, um, uh, he's a person of Asian or Chinese descent. He, he uh, uh, has spent most of his life in uh, Singaporean culture, a culture that really emphasizes success academically. So, um, so he must like, um, feel a lot of pressure from like filling uh, his math exam or something like that. Um, when it, you know, like when you operate from that lens, you know, having that openness uh, to be corrected when that person uh, volunteers some information that stands contrary to what you think you know. So uh, I think it really emphasizes that, that, that openness to be wrong and not wanting to like impose any of your preconceived notions of, uh, in your interactions with that person. So always uh, being on a, a path of discovery um, with that person and with anyone that you, you meet. And, uh, and that necessarily means that it, it's never, uh, uh, it never has an end point <laughs> because you're never gonna be able to meet everyone on earth, but um, mm. But but yeah, being being open to to discover new things uh, oh. at every second. Cool. Thank you both so much. I've I've definitely learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Alan. Hi, hi Alan here. Um, I wonder what what proposals we do have a greater inclusiveness. <clears throat> um, Darren suggested that people of colour need to be invited to the table, so to speak, um, which set me pondering really about attitudes um, to psychedelics amongst 
Afro-Caribbeans. So the sort of Windrush generation are very, very culturally conservative. That's my impression. Um, and intent on kind of respectability and be very shy of any kind of controversial treatments. Uh, the other kind of extreme, you've got the kind of postcode gangbangers who are selling weed and crack, no doubt using weed themselves. I kind of doubt that, um, this is kind of a question for Darren to answer, I guess. I doubt that they would be very attracted to the use of psychedelics themselves. Um, but obviously I simply don't know. I've had the opportunity to, to ask to ask one of them. Um, but it might kind of, I have the feeling it might kind of threaten their macho culture, something that would kind of be kind of opening them up. Mm. Then you've got upwardly mobile black middle class. And I think they tend to have uh, inherited some of the conservatism of their parents. And again, I suspect they'd be very... Um, cautious about controversial treatments um, yeah. and such like. But I mean, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, currently psychedelic culture certainly is very much white and middle class. And it's something which personally puts me off kind of engagement um, with it as a, as a whole. And it seems to be kind of confined outside recreational use to middle class people seeking cure for their, for their neuroses. Um, in a kind of uh, indulgent new age kind of fashion. But I mean, if your struggle is at a more basic level, like seeking equality of opportunity, housing, work, and so on, then I suspect that psychedelics probably have very little attraction. So maybe I'm just wondering is the problem is not with psychedelics and their presentation, but um, those classes of people will eventually come to the table when they're ready, so to speak. Once they're, once perhaps they have the luxury of of introspection. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my question. I mean, I don't know if it's yeah, a bunch of no, questions. I don't know if I'll jump in there, Alan. And Darren, today in particular. Good, good to see you, Alan. Good Hi. to see you from Milifer. How are you doing? Um, and I appreciate your question as well, and I totally get it. And you're right on the money as far as the obvious surveying of the, you know, the two extremes of, you know, the very conservative, you know, religiously inspired older Windrush generation compared to the young people, you know, right now. Um, what I will say is through, you know, testimony and experience, I would say that presentation does play a big part in how this is received. I found in how I engaged in this path, it did take people that looked like me who had similar experiences to open me up to the reality that this could be a viable route for me. So that's one thing. Two, through my own experience, I can look at both. And I actually got a, a little plug. I've got a YouTube channel that I've recently launched. And on the YouTube channel, I've got testimonies from both elders in our community, plus young ex-gang members and parents who have the um, parents who have children who have been affiliated with these gangs whose children have been receptive to this. What we're finding now is that because we're in the current climate, it's illegal where we're at and stuff like that, people can't speak freely about their experiences and the results that they're getting, so to speak. Um, I'll say that to say that if it is presented in a way that is engaging enough that it relates to the people who you're trying to deliver it to, it does. It definitely works. So I'll go back to the young people I work with. The, I, we, would, we had the same project. And we were trying to target young people in gardening, food growing, same project. But the client, um, our colleagues at the time who were trying to engage these clients, their approach in engaging just wasn't fit for purpose. And it took somebody who may not have been as young as they were no more, but came from their community, just understood the language, understood where they're coming from, to say, this is why you're interested in food growing. You know, this is why you would be. And I had to use enterprise as a way to engage them, for them to then find the value of a seed or a seedling, you know, there was ways of engaging. And I say that to say it's no different from African and Caribbean people, you know, there's ways of interest. We are a very spiritual people, you know, we psychedelics are not presented to us as a spiritual tool, it's being presented to us as a therapeutic tool. So when you speak to my people from a spiritual perspective, who are very religious, although it may be counteractive to their 
school of thought of religion, it's still very interesting to them, at least at minimum, to start that dialogue going. And then you can share some of the other food for thoughts that these plants you know, offer. So there's just ways around it. And this is what I'm saying. When you allow those people who are already involved, engaged like myself to sit around a the table, these are the things that we can all chop up together and decide on the best approach or another approach, let's say, no different from young people. What, what is the upside on your mushroom growing training and such like in well, terms of ethnic diversity? So I, what I could say is this, so like what was interesting is I, the last three days I've done talks, I've done one last night and the one two nights before, I've done one on black mental health, the potential healing, the healing potential of psychedelics in African communities. And I was blown that we had one person of European heritage in there, everybody else was black. And this was all person of color from Asian and they, this is what we were discussing that five, seven years ago when I was first involved in the breaking convention and other circuits, that wasn't happening. So again, what people made clear is, ah, oh, Darren, you're speaking about stuff. You kind of make it relevant to us and I'll get it. So in that space, we had young people as well as elders who are considering, um, you know, the uptake in understanding it. And that's what I always say, do we? Yeah, we may be far from a wider community partaking and understanding and engaging, but there's a there's an educate, there's a step first for people need to be educated because they're not privy to what this is. So the, the stages of those who take the first step to be educated, basically start that journey and eventually get to a place where they're coming to the events, then they're learning how to grow for themselves, they're finding out what the processes are. And, you know, it's really difficult just because of the legal situation. And as you're aware, as a person of color, I would be, you know, more likely to get in trouble than the next man just for talking about it, let alone being in possession of it, let alone trying to distribute these things. So it's, you know, it's really difficult when you've seen the results and history shows that we're comfortable with these things and know how to use them is there's just been a disconnection and it's just about making a reconnection, I feel. Thank, thank you, Darren. Thanks. I mean, obviously you work at a community level very much and a roots kind of level and you're kind of at the opposite extreme to, to Terence who's working in that in that kind of medicalized setting uh, and obviously the approach is 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 very different I, I think definitely all of darren's insights personal experiences and challenges with communicating and delivering information about the use of psychedelics for healing is definitely reflected when we run these clinical trials so our site focused exclusively on recruiting people of color um and even you know like when we think about people of color they're not a monolithic whole um there may be like natural affiliations with folks who look like themselves right so if, when we bring in um a black or brown participant and I, my um my, my co-therapist was actually monica williams they naturally gravitated more to her because they looked like her so really, I, I think that this speaks to the idea of wanting to diversify your study staff too, so that you can be a source of comfort and appeal for folks who are, who may be sitting on the fence, you know, like not all of the people that we brought in for the informed consent form, uh, informed consent visit eventually went on to enroll in the study for various reasons. They might uh, not want to participate or not are not eligible. But I think the way that we deliver the uh, information is very important. They mm. may want to know a lot more than our white participants about um, the safety and effects of MDMA, for example. Is it going to cause a hole in my head, right? Am I going to get addicted afterwards? These are rarely some questions that we hear when we talk to other sites when they recruit predominantly white participants or people who fit the profile of a psychedelic user uh, and who are conventionally recruited for these trials. Mm. So naturally, like there are some like concerns that we need to attune ourselves more sensitively to and, and actually meet people where they are. Um, a lot more hand-holding than you would expect. And, and that really made for a, a challenging recruitment experience, but one that was very informative as well. Um, and it, it has become like a mission of mine and Monica's as well to to convey some of these insights about what it's like to recruit folks of color into psychedelic clinical trials for the for for the rest of the uh, scientific community. Um, and I think our question now shifts to exactly what Darren was talking about. How can we convey information in a way that meets people where they are 
so they they uh so we're thinking about like do we need to really tap into gatekeepers in the community point point per people that really you know have to final say okay if like pastor george says that um it's cool and it's completely um uh consistent with our religion to imbibe in psychedelics for healing then maybe you know i'll give it a shot you know this might be the seed of curiosity that they need to be planted to move them from you know being ambivalent about it to like okay let's find out more information about it mm. thank you Sharon. thank you alan for your questions um Fatimata has her hand up would you like to ask hiya can you hear me yeah. awesome hello everyone um those were brilliant talks. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I've got one question that I would sort of want the both of you to sort of um, answer and then one specifically for Terence. So um, having specifically worked with young people as well, um, who, you know, research is showing that it could essentially um, benefit everyone what are your feelings about the kind of um, criminalization and the war on drugs on the kind of specific um, substances that you are talking about? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the UK, there's a maximum, I think, seven year sentence for um, magic mushrooms and that kind of stuff. And with all the narrative about don't do drugs and all this kind of stuff, how do you sort of um, correlate that with actually um, medicinally it can be used but not rec recreationally and then so in terms of let's say okay it becomes acceptable um, you know in terms of me being a bit of a cynic you know you might have um, companies and pharmaceuticals who would sort of monetize it and basically sell it and if the people who then need it cannot afford it and you could get a hold of it and you know it works you take it recreationally and you know there's the whole seven year sentence thing so what do you you guys think um in terms of the whole sort of um government narrative that is played on drugs and how do you think the field should move forward um especially when that that actually might be one of the reasons why a lot of ethnic people like myself for example when asta told me about the study i said no way in heck would i do that um so how would you sort of um hope that the field can work around those issues that's my question for both of you Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> right, um, yeah, powerful question. Um, I feel, um, you know, there's there's a few perspectives I have on that because, you know, you, you shared a lot there and, you know, a few things come to mind. But ultimately, the, you know, the provisions in place, you know, as far as, you know, the, the, the um, impact of, you know, being caught with these drugs and the seven year sentencing and things like that, these, again, these are kind of like ongoing trials and tribulations that myself and others have found we just have to deal with in life in general um so i say that to say as much as i don't encourage anybody to break the law and get into trouble but again i work with young people who are breaking the law that's the young people that i work with <laughs> and telling me what they're doing and what and they get up to i've got to, you know as a you know an elder and older i've got to be conscious of what advice how i advise them and all the rest of it i'm saying that to say that don't think too much i wouldn't want you to think that too much that like the young people are not privy to this stuff i said i'm working with young people and said sir so you're into magic mushrooms so what's that about and <laughs> they're really interested in this stuff like i don't think that they're that, that naive or that you know far removed from wanting to know what this is first and foremost and two if they're prepared to sell crack heroin like some of the young people i work with you know the seven year sentence isn't too much of a taboo to start that dialogue so i'm just saying that to say that we're not that far from really getting the people on the side so really it's the system in place as far as you know and as i said it's the same system the same models that have existed for generations now that also perpetuate in the in the psychedelic community and it's not individuals it's a you know it's a consciousness it's models that exist that you know uh you know that exist that people follow through so the way we organize a meeting you know with a 
person, a, a secretary and someone taking notes and things like that is just the way that we do meetings. And for young people, that's boring. You know, so I've got to make the meetings slightly different. So it's just being aware of those conditions that and challenges that those people face and see how you can accommodate that. If you're conscious enough to be aware of that, if you're not conscious enough to be aware of that in the first place, then me personally, I don't have the expectations that that's what the care is going to be delivered. And then I really encourage the people from those communities who do have the professionalism, do have the experience to kind of stand up and be counted, you know, and not, you know, blame the young people for making bad decisions or so to speak, or point fingers at the, the institutions because they're not doing their job. It's like, if you're a psychotherapist and you feel this way, then you've got to stand up and stand in your square and rally up those who can support you in doing the right thing whether that's criminal you know the criminal side of things or whether that's just access and participation like i said there's just so many areas and you've got to kind of approach each of them slightly different because like you said it's different groups of people that we're talking about so the young people who are getting in trouble are not the young people who are in university so the way i'm going to engage them is going to be you know will be different so it's going to take us to come around the table for the police officer. that's what we do with the young people who are getting in trouble we sit down with the local police we sit down with their parents we sit down you know with the the various provisions to work out the best approach in working with this young person so it doesn't come from you know one perspective and i think that's the challenge at the moment it's like the usual suspects so to speak sitting sitting around the, sitting around the tables making the decisions i don't know if i've answered the question but that's kind of <laughs> yeah. i think i think darren also um uh to that at least I'm, I'm speaking from like working in above ground spaces too um that actually younger people of color were the easier population to recruit from um and and this is entirely within the context of america just thinking about okay so what is the drug education program existing in schools what's the state of those programs right now so if you're thinking like maybe 20 30 years ago folks in high school had the dare program it's still in existence right now but i don't think it's particularly popular or prevalent across most high schools right now um, oh what's happening in terms of technology oh you have th this proliferation of multiple news articles that you saw that you presented in your own uh talk to darren um, like The Guardian, like uh, uh, MSN, BC, et cetera, all of the popular news outlets are all talking about this buzzy topic of psychedelics for healing. Who's really reading these articles? Who has, who's always like, has a phone attached to their arm? So, <laughs> so my thought is like, oh, obviously younger people, they're more savvy with social media. And it does like show up when we go out in the community, present some uh, talks about psychedelics, uh, incite some interest in, in psychedelics that, you know, it's usually the younger people who are most enthusiastically calling our, our study line for, for more information about whether they can participate. So I, I think, you know, for me, the, the harder to reach group would be older people of color. Um, they've been through, uh, you know, they personally have been involved in the war on drugs. They know people who uh, have been involved in the war on drugs. They've lost family members, people in the war on drugs. How do we uh, acknowledge that whole space for that and, and, and say at the same time, you know, um, this has potential for addressing some of your issues. In the, clinical, in the clinical trial setting itself, when people participate uh, in the trial, they are in America, they're given a card that says, okay, if you drug test me, you may find trace levels of XYZ psychedelic substance. Um, and thinking about like people of color and police violence and brutality in America, that card usually, you know, is not enough to reassure people to participate in the study. What more can we do to convey some or to pad on some more level of comfort for people? Uh, people might be thinking, oh, I, I don't want to like participate in the study. I, I haven't even thought about it. Oh, if I like get pulled over by the cops and they, you know, like want to submit me to a drug test later on, they're going to find traces of MDMA in my body. I'm going to be put away. 
no way am I going to take that risk, right? I look, that's the way I look like, you know, the, I'm the exact target that police officers want to target. Um, so that's a really hard question for me to answer. And I don't know if I have an answer right now, but it's always been on my mind. How can we reach those harder to reach uh, populations? Thank you so much for that. It gave me quite a lot to think about. Um, I think I will give, uh, so my second question was for Terence. I hope this isn't another really hard question um, as well. But in your presentation, um, you know, you, you shared your specific experience with psychedelics and also with your participant and just looking at the drawings and um the sort of flower i'm not sure, i can't remember but the course course flower the corpse flower that yeah um how do you i mean i appreciate that this might be quite a personal question but how do you sort of um i don't know what the word is reconcile with the fact that you could potentially be delving into quite a lot of kind of personal and deep rooted um, things within yourself when you have these experiences and how would you deal with that? Because I think as well with trying, I mean, I am not into, so I'm, I am not a mental health practitioner or anything like that, but, um, but I do, imagine the when saying oh yeah I had this experience and it was very very deep you might have a lot of people who actually don't want to delve that deeply and they don't want to go that far into the mm -hmm. trauma that they have experienced so how did you specifically deal with that especially because of all the background you shared mm -hmm. and and how do you think that can be used for other people who might want to take part in the studies and the trials? I think the main reason why I felt in a place suitable enough to say, okay, let's just go ahead with this dosing session um, was a lot of preparatory work before the first dosing session. So getting to know my co-therapists well, um, feeling like they could support me in whatever I'm about to talk about whatever may emerge that have, has been difficult to deal with in my past. So the corpse flower, I think, was like an ode to dealing with internalized racism, moving to America. Oh, I'm the way I look. Um, uh, and I moved from a country where I was a, a member of a majority group to a, a, another country where I'm now a member of a minoritized group. That's probably gonna mess a little bit with uh, my feelings of safety and security. Uh, uh, having like really brought to the forefront, oh, I, am I really gonna be judged for the way I look? Um, so feeling supported enough uh, to go into that space of vulnerability before we, I, I agreed to take the pill um, was very important to me. And I think that's something, the level of psychological support that is offered in an above ground clinical trial uh, was is important. And it's something that we emphasize to people um, as they navigate their decisional process as to whether to eventually enroll in the trial or not. That said, you know, we, we may not see that level of psychological support for underground psychedelic therapy. Um, and I say that with caution too, is because, you know, when we think about um, psychological support, we operate from a Western lens. Oh, that means like talk therapy. You're talking to someone uh, about and processing your experiences. For me, I don't think that's, uh, that's a very vanilla um, version of how you can have some integration of some difficult insights. Um, that itself too, it, you know, like the, the substance itself also allows you to go to that place without being overwhelmed. So, so that's another piece of the picture. But for me, the way I integrated those experiences, like the way I navigated that level of internalized racism really was to reach out to my culture by um, cooking a dish from my, um, of my uh, Southeast Asian heritage every week. 
So I would find a recipe uh, that really spoke to me that I was missing because I was now in a strange country that didn't serve that kind of food. So I had to make it on my own. So the more dishes that I made, the more I feel like, oh, yeah, this is like actually really tasty. I actually uh, can't believe I'm able to recreate this dish. And it emboldened me to share my culture with other people through food. So this is really reaching back to, to, to the Singaporean identity. Food is culture in Singapore. So that was my way of integrating my internalized racism and how I navigated through that uh, was with food. Uh, and it wasn't with talking with people. Thank you, Terence. Um, Amata says thank you in the chat as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Terence and Darren? Fred, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, this might sound a little odd, but um, sometimes in these discussions, being um, of European descent, it seems a little paternalistic sometimes to hear people of European descent say, we think we know what is good for you and we think we know the best way to present it for you. And, um, uh, and this, you being other cultures, people from other cultures, and I'm wondering if people of um, European descent ought to just um, respect that the Japanese or the Egyptians or the Congolese or the Filipinos will arrive at their own uh, methods of um, helping each other. And who do we think we are to be putting our trip on other cultures, to borrow a phrase. And it's interesting to be bringing this up uh, when Terence and Darren are here. Uh, I wonder if it ever comes across that way that um, Europeans are letting, are telling you what's best for you. Um, I'm just wondering if it ever comes across that way as somewhat paternalistic. I could easily answer that and say yes, in my lifetime, you know, but even school, man, these are, you know, this is always kind of been part of the experience of being taken from where you're from. As I said, me being first generation, but, and as Terence mentioned, you know, just, just, just some of the simple things, you know, like the disconnection from your food, you know, that ties in with your heritage and, you know, you kind of got a shape shift to accommodate you know, especially being a black male in this country, you know, the amount of times I was told that, you know, I'm aggressive, the way I move, the way I, my energy, so to speak. And that's just like, again, normal. I'm, no, I'm not angry. I'm not upset. This is just the energy, you know, and being told I need to calm down. I need to, it's like I'm, you know, so throughout a lot of life, just as a child, these were some of the challenges that I faced where I can relate to the young people with, you know, today with, you know, the, the illusion, what we, we call it the illusion of authority, these authority figures that are telling you what's best for you, kind of thing and what they don't do a lot of the time we're not generalizing but it's like ask but that's why i get a lot of traction with young people because ask them what's going on in their mind what's going on how are you doing how are you feeling why you feel like that and then they say oh sir you're cool because you actually ask us what what, what our concerns are and it's like it's not hard work it's just like, i'm genuinely interested in how you're doing so it works both ways whether it's race gender it's like just being sincere when you approach it and it's not about saying oh you need help i'm going to help you like this this is the help i'm going to provide for you it's more to do with, oh, you need help. How can I help you? I'm going to allow that. <laughs> but with psychedelic assisted therapy, isn't that saying, this is how we can help you? Yeah. So um, with that said, it's just similar to Terence with the food thing, you know, I talk about with psychedelics and the integration, you know, a big part of the integration in, in Africa and around the world is singing and dancing. You know, it's not somebody sitting down and, you know, so the models, again, may not fit the, you know, the therapeutic, the, the, the clinical center, because, you know, in Africa, we want to pull out some drums. 
We want to get mm -hmm. in a circle. Mm -hmm. We want to raise energy and deal with things a certain way, and that is not fit for, you know, the hospital setup, so to speak. So again, it's these, you know, these models that may not be considered of well. When you do do this, your so we leave up to you. How do you go about handling it? And it may not be complementary to the, you know, the approach of the, you know, the, the people who hold the, the power. So yeah, there, there, there's a lot of that in general, you know, in in the world. That's what the Black Lives Matter and all these things that are. For, for trying to present, for trying to present this um, treatment, provide this treatment uh, for people not of the Western culture. I mean, who are we to say this is the way it should be, or this is how you yeah. should do it? I mean, I, I, I think, Brad, the truth of the matter is. And I will say I'm not a historian, but little, you know, like psychedelic therapy is everyone's birthright. It's everyone's cultural birthright. And somehow some, somewhere along the way through globalization and mainstreaming of Western culture, the disconnect was created between, you know, communities of color, um, uh, cultures with a rich history of use of these psychedelics. You know, younger folks of color have have been separated and disconnected from their cultural birthright of the use of psychedelics for healing. So when um, people are presented with, oh, this is how you heal psychedelic therapy, um, it comes across as Western because, you know, the, the history of psychedelic use has been whitewashed and, and, you know, not a lot of accounts of, you know, indigenous use of psychedelics for healing has been published or, or preserved through the ages. Um, but if we dig deep enough, you know, and if we present that information for people, it can be framed as a way for people to reconnect with their cultural birthright for healing. Um, and so I think psychedelics were used in your culture? Oh yeah, I mean, opium. No, I meant I meant mind manifesting uh, drugs. I, I think of psychedelics as as consistent with any substance that alters your state of consciousness. You mean um, like nicotine? Say what? Like nicotine. The, the, there have been various uh, forms of opioids that have been used in Chinese culture and in in a specific way that hasn't. That doesn't connote any any indication of abuse. No, but I guess I, I guess I was talking specifically about the classical psychedelics, mm -hmm. the ones that we're talking about, and uh, were they were they used in your culture? I imagine so. There has been some accounts of magic mushrooms used in Chinese culture as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll come I'll come back to that as well. There's there's definitely accounts of mushrooms being used in Asian culture for sure. The tacky, the tengu tacky, there's mythology that goes along with it and stuff. Yeah, I'm into mythology, so it's so yeah, it's, it's in the mythology if you believe. So, so, so back to the point, it's, it's kind of like how do we reintroduce that to people? Um, so, so I think part of the information part of the story, um, uh, in the way that psychedelic therapy has traditionally been introduced in clinical trials hasn't been represented. So maybe we need to reach deeper into those roots of how the global use of psychedelics for healing has come about. I guess that's the core of my thought also, because it seems as if this seems to be the only model, <laughs> you know, this, uh, the clinical model from the, from, from the West. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that we would then just try to impose that or, or, or um, imply that that's the way every culture should mm -hmm. adopt this healing. And Darren brought up a good point, you know, drumming, uh, um, doing it in a group, you know, radicalizing ways of psychedelic therapy. Um, and of course, you know, if you want to do it in an above ground way, you know, you're still functioning within a predominantly white slash Western space with uh, requirements for how you conduct a clinical trial. So obviously, you know, this may be further in the future. Um, 
when we reach stages of approval for various psychedelic substances that we can begin to think about how to expand it and diversify ways of administering psychedelic therapy. Well, as you were speaking, I was wondering about um, how do you approach, how does, how does someone from uh, a European background approach someone from a different culture? Maybe it is to study that culture's use of psychedelics in the past and try to use that model as opposed to the um, Western model. Mm -hmm. That's definitely, you know, a way, a, a way to think about how can we respect ways in which it was originally conducted. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for that. <laughs> Fred Jonathan has just linked um, a Wikipedia page in the chat um, titled Hallucinogenic Plants in, in Chinese Herbal Medicine. Um, so to answer your question seems like there's some. And I think that this kind of brings it back to the point, uh, Terence, that you made at the end of your talk where um, being therapists, being culturally competent or being willing to meet people halfway or maybe even further than halfway by educating themselves about um, the uh, details of different cultures um, and how that might affect a participant's um, experience psychedelic and in the clinical trial setting as a whole. Um, I know that Uma had a question as well, so I'll let her jump in now. Thank you so much um, for organizing this evening. Terence, Darren, really, really insightful. And um, I think here tonight feels quite special hearing this and kind of for me urges that need for BME only spaces. Sometimes when we talk about this, you said about attracting more people um from uh being a woman of color or something like that just saying how do we attract more people and i think there could be something around safety because working as a gestalt practitioner i think there's so much fear i don't see a lot of black clients i don't see a lot of male uh, black clients and i think there is so much fear around that and and i just want to quote um some work around um i think dr eileen allen talks about slavery being still happening that uh, black young people are on the street they're, they're, they're having the drugs and that white middle class people don't go to prison and I just wanted to share that dynamic I think Fred was mentioning about the paternalistic model you know that is this paternalistic and I think that actually this would be an amazing gate opening experience for young people and people of colour we've been robbed of this it, it feels like an additional trauma in some ways that our ancestors would have been taking this that our ancestors would have been using these healing medicines and I noticed that the drug landscape is changing there's DMT vapes around the language around psychedelics is is changing and, and I'm just wondering you know how here tonight we can move forward with some of these discussions about creating some safety because I think there is so much fear when we when we talk about psychedelics and I think that pushes people of color away from spaces like this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. That's um, a really good point in the same way that um, um, you have women's only circles, um, men's only circles, uh, BAME only circles have their um, value, not necessarily just to do with psychedelics, but generally speaking. So I'm afraid I don't know of any myself that um, specifically are centered around speaking about psychedelics. Um, don't know if anyone else here on the panel knows any. Well, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt the panel. Yeah, sorry, Darren, please go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, you know, the, the challenging thing when it comes to psychedelics and circles is we're in the UK, it's something that's illegal and because of the load that it carries for people of colour. We cannot freely open it up and just say, oh, this is where we're at. We're meeting here on a Thursday for the fear of being raided and stuff like that so you know i just really want to you know we're not there yet but i really want to open up the idea and the reality that there is there's stuff but there's people doing the work you know and it's just a shame that they've got to do it in the way they've got to do it or they've got to fly you know to jamaica <laughs> they've got to fly to trinidad and find the places where it's legal to feel comfortable around that because of the legality but this is you know it's it, it's happening you know it's this but like I said, it's now happening because I feel there's people who look like the people 
presenting it to them in the ways that in a language that you know it resonates so it's taken a while but allow people to do them as we would say do you kind of thing and like Frederick was saying you know just you know allow the people to kind of work it out themselves as well and have faith that you know we you know we want to be better we want better communities for ourselves we want you know we do want those things you know and we have attempted to grow and develop in those ways before and it's been shut down you know just having a meeting to have the benefit the community let alone you're having a meeting and talking about something that's illegal and stuff like that and potentially encouraging people to do that and break the law it's really challenging but I don't think it's not happening <laughs> you know we said that the young people like you said they got the vapes they got the this they're teaching me the young people are showing me I'm like I'm doing you know the workshops and stuff and studying and my daughter's coming home and telling me about because she's studying psychology and she's talking about this people within that you know the, the current course that they're you know um coursework that they need to complete that psychedelic is one of the subject matters that they're discussing and she's like oh, oh. We're, talking about, we're talking about psychedelics in sixth form you know as a you know and I'm like I told you your dad wasn't stupid you know <laughs> trying to know why I got into this but you know the young people they're there man and us as adults we're not around young people enough to be thinking oh they're not ready they don't think I don't think young people will accept this or be into this. You'd be surprised. They're bored. Remember, young people always say, I'm bored, I'm bored. They want something to do. You break them out, you get even a conversation around it widens their eyes. And they're smoking weed, they're trying all these other types of things. And if you can have a, a dialogue with them that brings them to an understanding that, well, if you're prepared to do this and there's these options and those options, you know, it, it resonates. It's, you know, it, it's, it speaks for them. And whether they do it or not is a net thing. But I think the first step is just the education to break down those barriers. Mm. And they're open. They're open to this. Yeah, I guess it kind of brings me to the idea of harm reduction and safety. So um, even though these substances are illegal in the UK and in the US for um, personal or recreational use, um, as you mentioned, Darren, people still do use them. And um, for example, we have an integration group with the Mozi Psychedelic Society. So perhaps, uh, yeah, and the purpose of that is to give people a safe space to talk about um, experience if they, they've had and if they're struggling it's sort of providing some kind of psychological support in a group way um, and I wonder that perhaps maybe um, you know a safe space for black and indigenous people of color um, in, a, in an integration group might be more um, palatable to uh, some fears but yeah I hear I hear you and and Uma when you say that there's a lot of fear um, which is you know, understandable. Catherine, I'm, I'm actually curious in terms of how integration circles are run in the UK, um, or at least for your, for the integration space that you've been involved with, what are, you know, maybe some words of reassurance or maybe safeguards that have been put in place to communicate to people that should there be a raid, like Darren said, or, or like some, some inquiries about your involvement in this space um, that it wouldn't lead to anything significantly legal? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, simply talking about uh, use that's happened in the past is not necessarily illegal. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in all our advertisement materials, we we say that we do not support or encourage the use, um, but we're simply here because we acknowledge that people do use them and therefore there are harms associated and we're here to help as best we can minimize those harms. So I keep saying we like I'm personally involved. Um, it's, it's hosted by various people in our team um, who do have professional training in mental health um, service provision, various levels, but are not there in their professional um, capacity. Uh, so yeah, that's, that is, that is um, kind of the, I don't know, Astra, if you have any, any other bits um, about the integration group, but um, usually when it's not COVID times, it's hosted in a Buddhist center, um, which feels pretty safe. Hi, Asta here. Um, yeah, maybe just to kind of echo what Catherine said in that um, the act of harm reduction isn't legal in itself. Um, I mean, there are charities such as Psycare who work in 
festivals that work on harm reduction, supporting people who are kind of having active trips. Um, and I guess it's important to have that safe space. And in terms of integration group, um, it is just allowing the safe space for, and to facilitate discussion around it. I guess, similar to today, we're kind of discussing psychedelics in an open space that in itself isn't um, illegal. I mean, these trials that are being done, they're done within a legal capacity and that is recognized. So even it's open to participants of trials, for instance, mm -hmm. um, as well as people who are taking it recreationally. Um, mm -hmm. And I think having that space in itself um, is really important for people who otherwise may not have had access to safe space and discuss this openly. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's definitely really important and for people who may be worried or ramifications of that, I guess from integration from our side, we haven't had anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no police has raided the Buddhist center. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I mean, and... I brought that up just just to, to to imagine like okay, like a newcomer to like an integration space might be thinking about this, so that might be a word of reassurance for them. Oh this uh, circle has been hosted for two years now and nothing bad has come out of it for folks who go to it regularly. So maybe I should give it a shot. Yeah. I think when thinking about the circle, it's important to know that it is just discussion. I mean, people aren't taking psychedelics there. It's mm -hmm. not the kind of provision or it's not a space where, because I know that in some um, cultures, there may be ceremonies where people are in a circle taking psychedelics. This isn't, it's, isn't like that. It's literally just the discussion where people can maybe either share their experiences, um, maybe have some insights or also there to, to learn as well. It is purely just kind of discussion-based harm reduction rather than the active participation. Cool. It's also totally confidential. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, I'm aware we're very close to time and Moda, I can see that you've put some questions in the chat, which I'm sorry that I, I missed. Um, although I am also aware that some of our panel have engagements later on in the day. So um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to ask your questions, but um, Darren has left his um, contact details. Um, if you message us and if Terrence is happy for us to share his email, we can share that with you. Um, but yeah, basically to be continued. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, especially to Darren um, and Terence for speaking tonight. And um, I hope you have a nice evening slash afternoon wherever you are. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.